And welcome, friends, to this, the Thursday morning edition of the Grace Hour. We're broadcasting live here from our studios. And our studios are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, Maryland. And thank you so much for joining us on this Thursday and hope you'll stay with us for the next 40, 45 minutes or so as we continue to develop our theme this week on the Grace Hour. We have been discussing mental health crises and today we'll continue that theme as we look together at what this subject might be called the dark night of the soul. And what exactly does that mean, especially for the believer? And if someone finds themselves in such a place, how can we provide some help and some counsel, some direction to move them from that into a place where the light of God's grace shines brightly on them once again? These are the issues that we'll be talking about today in the broadcast, and we thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, friends, if you have the opportunity to do so, Subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. And, of course, a quick reminder about tomorrow's broadcast coming up on the Friday edition of the Grace Hour. You can join them then for the final episode as we have discussed this uh, important theme all this week live on the Grace Hour. And I think it's safe to say that as we um, take a look at this subject matter together with you, our listeners around the globe, We are not mental health professionals, but we're trying to provide some direction and some guidance from the scriptures regarding the stability of our souls. My name is Pastor John Love. Joining us in the studio today is Pastor Tom Schaller, the senior pastor here at the Greater Grace World Outreach. And Pastor Schaller, I was greatly encouraged to hear that when you returned from Eurocon that you had spoken to a number of people that expressed how much they tune into the Grace Hour podcast and listen to it and and enjoy it. And that was pretty encouraging to hear that. So we're not just broadcasting uh, locally here in the Baltimore area, but across the country and around the world. And that's uh, pretty exciting to think about. Yeah. And also, Pastor Love, it's the evidence of uh, God's work, the Spirit of God uh, ministering to people. And that um, we are, we are pastors, um, church leaders, counselors, that um, really want to hear from God and hear from His Word, because we we know that the Word is a resource. Um, there's Second Timothy chapter three, is like very high. Um, the, the nature of it is of a, a very high regard or high status, um, what, what it is. If, just to think of these words, it says, <clears throat> all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. If you could imagine the Bible, the word, the um, scripture is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and really what it does in changing a life and molding a life and uh, developing a life um, that's not dependent on uh, the ways of men, but it is the counsel of God. So uh, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, unto all good works. I mean, if you take a pastoral ministry, remember, like the word psychologist wasn't really used uh, in the 19th century. And so we have centuries where the predominant counselor in a local community was the Word of God, was the pastor with the Word of God. And and we really shifted, our society shifted and become very sophisticated in, um, in what we would call the, you know, the world of psychology. But uh, uh, the fact that people need help, the, the fact that people need to learn love, they need to learn not only about their liberty to be whatever they want to be, but also accountability and responsibility to be who God wants me to be. Mm. So this is um, really 
really an issue where you have a, a, a need to define what our goal is. And, um, and I really love being a pastor and uh, being called into it and helping people find God and find uh, God's mind and be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Um, one other text here is, meditate upon these things, give yourself wholly to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. In doing this, thou shalt both save yourself and them that hear you. Mm, amazing. And I think that it's important for our listeners to know that that's the direction we want to bring them in, is uh, to the Word of God, which can produce that change, can do the molding that you mentioned, and develop the soul so that it's a healthy soul. Yeah. Um, when I heard about this theme, the first thought that came to my mind, the dark night of the soul, I thought we were going to be discussing a, a Batman movie. Uh, but this is something that perhaps a lot of uh, believers can identify with, because perhaps at one time a believer had a joy unspeakable, full of glory. But now that same soul is like in a room filled with darkness. And the question is, you know, what's happened? Um, we're reminded of what Paul the Apostle wrote, that, that we have this treasure, but the treasure is, is found in an earthen vessel. And the earthen vessel is, is frail, is vulnerable. It can break down. Um, it can find itself in a state of fear, anxiety, even depression. But that doesn't impact the nature of the treasure that's within them. The treasure mm. remains intact. And the question is, how can that treasure once again find its way through the, the darkness? <clears throat> you know, in Job 3, verse uh, 1, it went, this is after he's been hit very hard by the uh, by the devil uh, he's lost his family his children possessions and he said um, cursed uh, he he said opened his mouth and cursed his day and job spake and let the day perish wherein i was born in the night in which it was said there is a man child conceived let that day be darkness let not god regard it from above neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Uh, let, let no joyful voice come therein. Now, this is a saint of God. This mm -hmm. is Job. And for him to define his uh, trouble and um, his pain and the darkness that, that he's experiencing is, is good for us because it can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And Job was really an awesome believer, and that's one of the points, that even if you are an awesome believer, you might be... Um, really, uh, you know, in a very, one day very, very sad because of something that has happened to you. So um, uh, when we look at the book of Job, it, it's meant to teach us that you cannot know what, what your life will bring and um, you don't know, neither do you know why did it happen to you this way. You don't know what and you don't know why, uh, but you also know that in the story, God is there. Yeah. It is possible for a believer to go through a dark season of their lives. Yeah. Um, David, also along with Job, and perhaps we could even put Jeremiah in that category, as well as other uh, saints that we read about in the Bible, uh, experienced that kind of darkness. David in Psalm 13 he said, how long will you forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my own soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? 
I mean, this is this is the giant killer. This is the 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 writer of these psalms and and the one that the great singer who stood before the Lord. How can he be saying such things? But again, it just shows us that this can happen in the life of of believers. But there is a way out. I, I think of David in Psalm thirty verse five when he said, "The weeping may endure for a night." And maybe it's not just a night, maybe it's many nights, maybe it's many weeks, many months, maybe even years. But the promise of God is that joy will come in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is a way out. I think sometimes believers may find themselves almost locked into this darkness. But wouldn't God tell them, you're not alone. Others have been through this. Others have been where you are. And God in his faithfulness will find a way to get you through it. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, I uh, I know that uh, th- there could be a sense where we just want people to survive and do well and get through things, um, and yet there's also something more in the in the subject, and and that is um, discovering Christ in the in the pain, discovering Christ in life, and. The Comforter, I will send the Comforter. Uh, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes where that on the side of the oppressor there was power, and um, that there was no Comforter. There, w- but the, on the there was no Comforter, and on the side of the oppressor there was power. And that the, the writer is saying, I have seen that, and you know, I like to reverse it and say that. Um, that there is a comforter, and uh, he's not an oppressor, but he's a comforter, and and with him there is power, and so that you can become very much healed and um, restored mm. because of that grace given to you. It, it it almost makes sense, and we can we can see this repeatedly in Scripture that God's people will go through some kind of a crisis. But the whole purpose of going through a crisis of that nature, and no one can say how long that crisis will last, is is something beneficial, something profitable uh, comes out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as long as we can... And, and I say that with the understanding that some people say, well, I, I, I can't hold on, I can't endure, I can't make it through this. But God... God will uphold his people. We might be Mm. cast down, but we're never forsaken. We're always, you know, in his capable hands. He hasn't forgotten us. Uh, We love what Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16 says. He has, you know, written our names in his hands. So we have not been forgotten if we go through these periods of, of life and We're going to come through it, but with a deeper sense of who God is and perhaps a more effective ministry to those around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, you're you're quoting from uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 6, I think, or is it 1 Corinthians 4? But the text I have here is 2 Corinthians 6, um, where it says... um, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Mm. You know, you really wonder how much suffering Paul has in mind when he's writing this. And we know that list in Second Corinthians chapter 11, where he gives a short autobiography with with emphasis on all of his sufferings, you know. Mm. And then in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings and fastings. So, you know, to to realize that suffering can be, I think for some people, they might have a lot of it in life and someone else very little. Mm. Well, suffering is part of it, and and Paul's attitude about it is written here. Yeah, 
again, he, he brings that out in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, reminding us that the treasure is in an earthen vessel. And he says, we're troubled on every side, uh, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. Um, all of those things he experienced and believers experienced. The affliction, is it real? Yes. But does it crush us? No. Uh, the perplexed uh, mindset, is that, does that happen? Yes, but doesn't bring us to a place of despair. The persecution, it's real, but it doesn't mean we've been forsaken by God and the, the, the idea that we've been struck down, that happens, but it doesn't destroy us. There's this paradox that he talks about, and this is the promise for the believer that you will, you can experience all of this and more. But God in his faithfulness is only going to use it to develop and to deepen your faith and drive the roots of your soul deeper into the promises of his word. Mm -hmm. There's a good illustration. There are species of trees that um, grow their root systems now, depending on the amount of water that they get. So there are these trees in England that I read about and where maybe this illustration is coming from, where they get a lot of water and then the wind can blow them over. But if they have drier, a drier environment, then the roots go like deeper looking for water. Mm. So on one hand, if... If they're deprived of the water, then they have to counter it by going deeper with their roots. Mm. And those trees don't blow over in a storm, wow. you know, because the root system is more elaborate or, you know. Mm. So uh, same with a Christian. If there was no suffering, I wonder how deep our roots would go, you know, if everything was easy. But when there's some contest there, then... Uh, we have to develop that and that faith and that that need for ministry with the word of life is is important. Mm. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. The dry periods of our lives, uh, when you have those dry periods of life, you feel as though nothing of any real value is happening or being produced in your life. When in reality. Most productive, be the most productive time of our lives when mm -hmm. those roots are going deeper. And even even a lightning strike, we understand, sends the roots of a tree deeper into the ground. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah. When, oh, really? It, it, it can potentially destroy a tree, but if it doesn't destroy it, the roots of that tree move deeper into the ground. So sometimes it's the unexpected trials of life that God uses to develop our souls. Mm. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, what about uh, somebody that loses their faith, Pastor Love? What about that? What would you say about that? That they, that they got hurt, you know, in life. They they question a lot of things. Even does God exist? Uh, they've even gone to church a lot. They've been to Bible school, maybe, but now they have a. Um, uh, um, a real issue regarding uh, is it true or not? Like, I don't even know if I believe anymore. Like, that kind of a trial of your, of their faith. I, I like to think that they could say, you know, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's possible that the soul could be characterized by both of those. Um, I, yeah, I think the crisis of faith can happen in someone's life. But again, I often think when, when that does happen, um, where does God stand? Uh, we are so susceptible to change in our lives. But now we're dealing with a God who says, I don't change. I am the Lord God. I do not change. Uh, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So I think it's possible for someone to reach the conclusion from their perspective, I've lost my faith. I've abandoned it. I've turned my back completely upon God. But God says, you know, it doesn't change the fact that your names are still written on my hands. And I'm going to find a way. 
Because these same people that have confessed that they've had that crisis of faith and they've abandoned their faith, um, perhaps down the road, years later, we see them return mm -hmm. with a fresh and a deeper understanding mm -hmm. of God and realizing and even coming back and testifying that even though I made the decisions I made, God still remained faithful to his promise to me, mm. which is profound when you yeah, stop and think about good, it. Very good. Have you personally ever been there? Have you ever really um, questioned your faith to the point where, you know, it was a crisis of some kind in your heart? I, I, I think it's safe to say I've moved in that direction, but I, God has kept me from ever reaching the edge of that cliff or even going over it. But I'm still confident that even if I stepped over the edge and came on and fell off that cliff, I just sensed that uh, he would catch me. Yeah. I just, there's something about the character of God that we have learned over the years that reminds me that even if I stop believing, he remains faithful. He cannot deny the nature of his covenant to us. Mm. And there's something, there's something greatly comforting about that, mm -hmm. you know, I, because when you ask that question, um, I'm, I'm grateful that I can say, I don't think I've got there yet. Maybe I have, and I didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. But I also know that even if I did, there's something about the nature of God that comforts me that says, you know, I'm going to be kept by the power of God. Yeah, well, beautiful. For me, um, it was it was almost uh, being motivated by I don't have any other option. Like it doesn't make sense. Okay, I don't believe anymore. Let's say I do that. I don't believe anymore. Okay, then what do I have? You know, what where do I go? What what do I have now? It's it's almost like when Peter said, you know. Where will we go? When Jesus said, "Will you leave also?" and they say, he, Peter said, "Where will we go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life." Um, you know, there's a lot of talking that goes on in life, but who has the words of eternal life? Um, now, now we're going entering into March Madness, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the in the college basketball teams and um, so there'll be a lot of talking about that. Okay, sure. but who has the words of eternal life? Mm. Who talks in a different way? Mm. Who talks about eternal life? That, that must have got a hold of Peter in, in a way where he just said, you know, what, once I hear these words of eternal life, like I know I could go many places, but who, who will have those words? Yeah. You know, I can do, you listen to March Madness for the month of March. I can follow the NFL. I can do uh, astrophysics or history or literature or poetry or government or politics. But who has the words of eternal life? Mm -hmm. So there, it was almost by, you know, default. I don't have any other options. Mm, yeah. But you're the best thing going, so I'm going to stick with you. Yeah, because who who... Who promises like like Jesus promises? So well, here here's the here's the other sorry here's the other thing. The guy says, "Okay, I lose my faith. You know, I don't believe in God anymore." Okay, all right. So go go hang out with the atheists. Uh, I go have a barbecue with the atheists. Um, go read your books and go, you know, live. You know, to be very frank, and uh, go live your life mm -hmm. and. And you're going to get what you get. You know, you play tennis. Okay, how was that? Okay. Uh, you study, maybe. You make money. You go run around and do your thing. Okay. How's that working for you, mm -hmm. right? So um, people do it. And then, then when they're done, when you're done, you know, uh, would you turn to God mm -hmm. and say that actually... This doesn't make that much sense to me, the way I'm living, you know. And we, we conducted that experiment already in our own lives. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it, it makes no <laughs> sense to us to say, let me go back and try it again. 
yeah. the results will be the same. Uh, yeah. uh, second generation Christians, they they brought up in a Christian family, a Christian home. They go to Christian school. Um, they struggle with this because they yeah. they don't know that other life, and they think that perhaps um, they haven't been told the truth about it. Maybe they could live this life and have different results mm-hmm. than what their parents have had or that we had. But in reality, they would be committing the same same mistakes. It would happen all and, over and, again. And they, they, I think the dark night of the soul is kind of a description of this faith crisis mm-hmm. where I'm saying, okay, I'm done. I'm not a believer anymore. Mm-hmm. So go for it. You know, go do your... And you, you have, if you are a believer and you're doing that, there is a darkness in your soul mm. that bothers you. And it would be maybe like the Jews saying, we want to go back to Egypt. Um, it was better there. We had better food there. We, have, we were slaves, but we, had better, we were secure. We have better food there and all this. And all that is just imaginatory inflated ideas. It was not a good deal to be in Egypt as a slave. Mm. Let's go back, you know, it's better. It's like, okay, go. Mm. But you can't get back there. Right. And then, and then you, but you can't go forward. And so you die in the wilderness in unbelief. And that's mm. like the dark night of the soul. Yes. Like you are really hurting and you, you can complain and kick and scream like God is so amazing with us because uh, he doesn't really um, pamper us. He just said, you're a call. Yeah. And you're going to live with what you got. And when and if you will humble yourself and come to me, I will heal you. I will restore you. I will lift you up. Mm. And um, But it's your call. It's amazing that he would give us that option, that choice. But he has, and yeah. he does. Uh, d- depression for some believers, it may be pr- profound, but isn't it important for them to know it, it, it's not it's not permanent and it does not have to be something that's fatal. And maybe uh, they are in the process right now. Part of that process is waiting, um, which is challenging for a lot of us. But yet, how often in the scripture do we see God telling his people, you know, wait. If you will wait, if you will just trust me with what, however little faith you have left in your soul and just stay there and trust me, you will see that I will come through for you. Mm. Waiting is, uh, is an important part because David was the one who asked that question in Psalm 13. You know, how long? You know, we might start out by saying, why is this happening? And that question changes into a different form, which is how long will I be in this condition? Mm-hmm. But God has a way out, doesn't he? he? He promises that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. In his faithfulness, he will provide a way so that we'll be able to endure whatever it is that we go through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you said it well. I mean, that's, uh, that's so true. I mean, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, there, David... Oh, you know, in the dark night of his soul when his son was taking over the throne and David was walking up um, uh, up, up the hill there, um, the mount, what's the name of it? I forget the name. You know, from Gethsemane up the hill. Mount Olivet? Yeah, Olivet, mm-hmm. yeah. When he's walking up there weeping, uh, with dirt on his head and barefoot. I mean, he's a king, and he's barefoot, and he's weeping, and dust is on his head, and he's struggling. I think that was extremely difficult, but but he trusted God, and um, it was he, the tables did turn. They were against him. It looked like it was it was curtains for him, and then, um, but God, he prayed, and God led him, and his counselor, and all those elements in the story, and then finally he does make it back to the city. Um, you know, when, 
no matter what you what you are facing as a believer, and as you said, even depression. Uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, I think he kind of shocked the evangelical world by saying that there is such a thing as bona fide depression. That's when you know somebody really has has great sadness. You know, in the modern world today, you're not supposed to be depressed. Right. To us, it's like it should be, and in history, I think depression was part of life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to be ashamed of it, and it's not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. It can be bona fide. You know, you've been, look at Job. I mean, you lose 10 children, you know, in a short period of time. Mm. Well, how is that going to affect you, Mm. you know? But, but good suffering or suffering in the, uh, as a believer is, is not a bad thing. And suffering is uh, part of life, and I think we have to understand that. Yeah. And David did. David knew, and he walked with God in, his, in the dark night of his soul. Mm. And I also think of, of Jonah uh, in, in the belly of that great fish yeah. in Jonah chapter 2. Um, could things have gotten any darker for him? I mean, once he decides to disobey God, it just seems to be this downward spiral in his life, you know, down to Joppa, down to uh, to Tarshish, down to the boat, down into the hull of the boat, and then over the boat into the water. And, And that great fish finds itself where the mountains begin to rise up from the earth at the bottom of the ocean, that's the dark night of the soul. Oh, yeah, that's deep water. Yeah, and he says, in his, he said, in my distress, I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me. Um, so there is hope for everyone who finds themselves in that, in that kind of darkness, because even there, God heard the cry of his servant and had prepared the fish I think you shared that the other night. He prepared that fish. He prepared those sailors. He prepared the storm. Everything was prepared by God. So God has already gone ahead of us and prepared for our deliverance. Yeah. Amen. Really. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's incredible. Well, we got a lot of comments uh, on the screen up there from the folks that are listening today. Um, and Dietmar has written to us, and he quotes from Psalm 27, verse 13. He said, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord during my life. And Carol writes that Jesus is our high priest. He knows all about the pain that we go through and helps us through these painful times. He understands and he cares. Isn't it true when you reach that moment in your life where you, you, that question comes forth out of your soul? maybe from the darkness that's there. Lord, you don't care? Don't you care? And I think of Peter. He was in a boat, looked like they were perishing. Jesus was in the boat, and he, and he, he literally almost accused Jesus and said, well, don't you care that we perish? And yet it would be the same Peter who later, when in his epistle, would write, cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Oh, okay. So, you know, his darkness, he went through it, but he came out the other end, and he knew how much he cared and encourages yeah. others to do the same thing, to cast their cares upon him. Regarding um, the Apostle Paul and, and his, um, you know, the sufferings, the dark night of the soul uh, for the Apostle Paul, um, it just looks like he always rebounded. He always came back with a message of grace and joy. It looks like um, no matter what, no matter how hard it was, um, he could write, come back with writing an epistle. Uh, he would come back encouraging the believers. He would tell them, uh, that it's not over, that God is uh, good, that God cares, and, um, and to live that way. And that's the, the way we have to relate to the people around us. I don't think people are looking for an easy way out. I think they're looking to find God in life and 
Um, it may be a process. It might be not not as quick. The restoration may not be as quick as maybe I want it to be. But as you said, uh, wait upon him. And patience is a key word. And love endures and to be patient and, and to see where it goes. But uh, uh, it might take some time. But don't give up. Have hope in God and uh, trust in him. Yeah, and we know that there is hope for those that find themselves in the, that, that dark night of their souls. And, of course, when you have darkness, the only thing that can deal with darkness is light. So in a very practical way, um, how does the light find its way back into our souls? And that light will dispel the darkness. Mm. Um, certainly, you know, having a local church, practically speaking, is one of the great benefits that God has given to us. Mm -hmm. And the fellowship of other believers helps to bring light back into our souls. But the promises of God, the proclamation of the word in a local church from a pastor teacher that God's raised up to feed your soul, all of these become practical means whereby light finds its way back into our souls. So we can't you know, underscore those those things enough because they're so valuable, they're so necessary if God, you know, is going to get us out of that darkness and see that noonday <coughs> light of his presence shine in our hearts again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need it. Yeah, uh, you know, when, when a woman married to her husband for 40 or 50 years and then loses him, um, uh, you know, there's sadness and... And she has to process it and uh, and adjust to living as a widow. Um, and I I care about the, those. I care about that because I see that happening with with um, folks in our church. And and I think that what we are saying is that um, that this is you know we are born into this world this way and for us to have um to, to realize that this isn't a bad thing it's part of everything i mean it's part of life so god will um be our comforter and help us in it and i love that 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 whole idea of jesus reminding us that when he would leave he would send the comforter and I mean, he, the Holy Spirit does live up to his name, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. he, provi he finds a way to comfort us, even in our uh, deepest despair and our greatest distresses. It's what he does. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of, of weeping, uh, enduring for a night, um, you know, I, I remember saying to someone once that was going through that, that their own dark night of the soul, um, and helping them to focus on the fact that joy is on its way. Uh, that's important for us. And again, we're not talking about happiness. I heard a, a recent survey where the United States, who used to be in the top several five or six countries for the most happy, um, has now fallen to number 23. So, so we're seeing darkness uh, like overcoming people's souls in our culture today. And for, uh, I want to you to know that the number one country for happy, they said, is Finland. Yeah. It's at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, but joy will come. Joy is on its way. That's a promise from God. And, and if you find yourself today and you're listening to the broadcast and you find yourself in that darkness, just be reminded, joy's on its way. Um, what route it takes, we can't be certain. How long it will take before it arrives, we can't be certain. But the promise of God is joy is coming. And it's going to replace um, that weeping, that sadness, perhaps even that darkness in your soul. Mm -hmm. That's important to remember. Any final thoughts, Pastor Scheller, before we wrap up the broadcast today? Uh, only, you know, just a general summary. Um, suffering is part of life. The darkness of the soul happens to all of us sooner or later. I think so. Um, there are many, many ways you can look at that, whether it's an external tragedy like Job or an internal conflict with my faith or I'm losing something very precious to me and I, I don't know what to do about it. 
Um, there, there are these things that happen to people, and ultimately you're responsible for your life. Nobody can make the decisions for you. You have to make them yourself. And we're just saying to people with a lot of uh, sympathy and understanding that, yes, it can be hard, but God is there for you. And he promised the comforter. He has given us promises, and we have a new way of life in our faith. Uh, If you lost your faith, you can get it back. You can find Christ again. He's there for you. It's your decision. And ultimately, when we stand before God one day, you have two categories, unbelievers at the white throne judgment, and there'll be no excuses, Mm. and believers at the Bema Seat judgment, and there'll be no excuses. Mm. We are just responsible for our own decisions, Mm. and God will hold us responsible. He's given us a lot. Let's recognize it. Let's embrace it. Let's walk with him and find... uh, uh, that light, that that will be the comfort for all of us. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, friends. We appreciate you tuning in to today's broadcast. And I know that some that may be listening, you could look, you know, within your own hands and say, I don't find anything. But when God looks at his hands, he sees your name. Don't forget that. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back for the Friday edition of the Grace Hour coming up a little less than 24 hours from now. Tune in to the next Grace Hour broadcast, and that's coming up quite soon. Thanks for joining us, friends. Until tomorrow, may God bless you.